Yeah, thanks, Theo. Uh, hello, everyone. Yeah, I'm just going to make sure I've got control of everything here. Yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, so my name is Martin Evans. Uh, as Theo mentioned, I'm, I'm head of product at Unboxed. We're a service design and digital product development company that works predominantly but not exclusively in the public sector. So we do a lot of work with local government, some in central government and some in the NHS, which is what I'm going to talk about today. Specifically, we're going to talk about a service we've created with Guy's and St. Thomas's uh, NHS Foundation Trust in the what they call the specialist ambulatory services, which is basically outpatients director of, the, of that trust. And the service we're going to talk about is uh, a remote monitoring service for patients with uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Um, some of you may have attended last year's conference where the clinical product owner, Melanie Martin, and I talked about the journey we'd been on um, and how we had plans to evaluate the service that is now running. Um, and in an ideal world, I'd love to give you an update on the evaluation and uh, talk about how it's validated the service and how we've iterated and improved and enhanced the service in the last year. But as you all know, the last year has been far from ideal. So um, progress has been slow. I mean, it was fairly slow before, but it's been even slower in the last year. So what I'm going to do um, instead is, is briefly give a bit of background to the, the, the project. I'm going to describe the product that we've built, um, the features of the product that we've built. Uh, and then I'm going to share some reflections on our approach. Um, I'm trying to focus a bit on where we've, we could have done things better, to be honest. I don't want to it, it, I mean, it's, uh, I'm very positive about the pro project. It's a, it's a great it's a great piece of work, but there are some things that maybe some learnings to be had. So I'm hoping to share some of those in some reflections. And I'd love I'd love for you to kind of comment and maybe uh, share some experiences at the end. We're gonna have time. I'm gonna talk for about half an hour, I think. So the remote monitoring project it emerged from a program of work which started in 2017, actually uh, a program to introduce some. Uh, uh, innovative concepts, I guess, design thinking, lean startup, agile principles uh, to teams in, in the outpatients department at GSTT. Um, within the hospital staff, we found there was a, a general frustration at the lack of real, real change that was being delivered by the uh, transformation and improvement programs that were in place. <clears throat> and ultimately, the, the, the staff felt that the service wasn't as good as it could be. Patients were being let down. Uh, by the service. There was an, certainly enough knowledge within within the staff and certainly the will to, to make a difference, but it seemed like what they needed was some space and time uh, and I think permission to do things differently. Um, and we were brought in to kind of provide some ex external support, a kind of catalyst to make that happen. We, we started off by running a series of workshops across lots of different services within outpatients. Uh, with service managers and uh, clinicians. So by clinicians, I mean doctors, nurses, other health professionals. Um, and we we looked at multiple different services. We looked at uh, uh, cancer services, dermatology, allergy, phlebotomy, sexual health, a few others. And what became apparent really quickly is that the, the teams very much understood the, the problem. So we, 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 we used a, a journey mapping process where we created some personas and described the journey of those patients through the service. And the teams were kind of <laughs> almost embarrassed at times as they discussed the patient experience. And it, it, was, it was almost like um, counseling sessions. We just asked a few questions and the team just, you know, described all the pain in the, in the system. And they were very aware, but the the sense you kind of got was that it, that's just the way it is. It's hard for us to do anything about it. There's so many obstacles in the way for us to improve the service and the experience of patients. <clears throat> in essence, what we heard is that an awful lot of time was being wasted. So patients, from a patient's perspective, patients were often traveling to appointments that weren't really needed. Um, they had to wait around for quite a long time, uh, waiting for those appointments and to have tests done. The tests may or may not be necessary, and then they had to wait too long for the results. And there was a lot of filling in of forms, which just it weren't, weren't very useful. And generally, the service wasn't, wasn't a great experience for patients. From a clinician's perspective, the waste was largely around uh, information systems. So lots of time wrestling with multiple poorly designed IT systems that didn't talk to each other to find uh, incomplete and inconsistent uh, information about patients. 
and the communication channels between the clinicians and the patients was mostly by letter, which just seemed um, uh, uh, very wasteful and you know, wasting in terms of money and time, really, the communication channels. So this was the kind of mantra of the team, don't waste anyone's time, especially patients. Um, having conducted these workshops across a number of different services, we, we, we could see some recurring themes uh, and some really important problems, which we felt if we could solve them within a single service, that would provide a pattern to then apply in other services. And one of those themes, which is illustrated here by uh, Malcolm's story, is this idea of uh, unnecessary appointments. And the, uh, I, I guess also, so appointments that you don't need, but are kind of routine, but you have to go to anyway, um, take time off work, you know, uh, travel reasonable distances to get there, things like that. And, and the kind of, the inverse problem of that is when you really need help, say you're a patient with a chronic condition, when you actually need help, it's quite hard to get the help that you need quickly. So we'd been working closely with uh, the team in rheumatology. They were very, there was a kind of an acute need around these um, repeat appointments, uh, unnecessary follow-on appointments. And the team were really open to doing something differently. So we focused in on rheumatology. Now, the particular condition we focused in is rheumatoid arthritis. So just to briefly, um, rheumatoid arthritis is a, is a long-term condition that can be effectively managed with some medication. Now, the medication is quite uh, significant medication, uh, med medication and it's um, <clears throat> so patients with um, low disease activity or who are in remission, aside for some regular blood tests to just make sure the medication is not having any adverse effects, uh, they're pretty much left to get on with it, aside for some periodic uh, check-ins where they have to visit the hospital maybe every six months or every year. Um, if they if their condition flares in the interim uh, flare means you know the, the, the disease becomes active and they become unwell then it's really difficult for them to get help they'll call the hospital they'll navigate automated systems um, they might go to the JGP they might even end up in uh, in, in A&E rather than get the specialist help that the hospital is there to provide them and this has some serious implications for the, the long-term health outcomes in, including um, you know disability and pain <clears throat> we received some funding from the Guys and St Thomas's charity to address this issue and set up a, a combined digital team um, <clears throat> with uh, a team from Unboxed Digital Specialists, as you can see there, and then a team from Guys and St Thomas's involving a product owner who is the person at the hospital that really owns the, owns the piece of work. Uh, that would be Mel, who was a, um, actually a physiotherapist room, working in rheumatology who had done some digital stuff before, but was really keen to understand this, this kind of digital thinking a bit more. Um, a, a service manager to kind of was on the team to smooth things within the hospital. And then of course we had the clinical lead in rheumatology who was really kind of backing the project and the approach. So we ran a, a, an agile design and development process to design, test and build a, a new system to support a new service in, in uh, remote monitoring. Um, <clears throat> in the initial phase of development, which was about uh, two, three, three months, we created a, we started with some basic features. We created an SMS messaging service um, built on the, the UK, the GovUK notify service. So we use a, a pre-built notification service of central government. Um, and that allows us to automatically kind of prompt patients to check in and tell us how they are and it allows us to respond to any issues that they might have that they can send in via SMS. Um, we also created a, an online PROM form. Now, um, PROM stands for Patient Reported Outcome Measures, and it's a really simple, structured, uh, and validated method to get feedback from patients, information from pa patients on how they're coping with their condition. Uh, and it's a pretty good indicator of disease activity. Um, <clears throat> so we created a simple online form for patients to submit regular, regular PROMs. And then we had a clinical dashboard, which was for uh, clinicians to view the patient's uh, data, their status over time and kind of scrutinize it and, and see what was going on with them. We launched this product. We had about 100 patients on board, like live patients actually using the system. 
and then we received a bit more funding from a pharmaceutical company who wanted us to uh, and who encouraged us to do the research funding but uh, allowed us to add some more features one of which was to automatically analyze the prom scores so um you have in, in, in the prom that we used, it's called a RAID. It's specifically for rheumatoid arthritis. It's about nine questions, I think. Uh, and it's a zero to 10 score for each one. And it creates an overall score. Um, <clears throat> so what we did was we analyzed the scores that were submitted, compared them with previous scores from that patient, and would, would flag up any either you know thresholds that were crossed in the score or any significant increases in the PROM score, which meant that their disease might be, be getting active. So we introduced a flagging uh, feature. We introduced a clinical assessment form called uh, DAS28, which is, the, is, is the, the method that clinicians use in face-to-face -face consultations to assess disease activity. So we built a form to allow that to happen. And then we added some support for blood monitoring which was a reminder to get people to uh, have their blood testing before their prescription expired uh, so that we could then pick up the results and automatically process them and flag up any anomalies for the clinical team to check. <clears throat> so where we are now with the project, <laughs> we've been in this kind of extended pilot mode for about three years now, it seems to be going on. Um, still uh, quite a small number of patients. It, it's got a full-time coordinator now, which I'll talk a bit more about in detail in a moment. But that coordinator essentially monitors all the incoming messages and, and, and observes any flags and responds accordingly, either seeking advice from clinicians where necessary or just giving the, asking the patient if they're okay or, or giving them some, uh, some advice or sending them some links to some guidance, say they're having problems sleeping, maybe send them some resources. Um, from a patient's perspective, they really appreciate it. It helps them feel more in control of their condition uh, and they feel cared for by the hospital, which is great feedback. And with the support of the, the Southwark Clinical Commissioning Group, which is the local authority Guys and St. Thomas's sits in, uh, the system has been rolled out across five more hospitals uh, within the South East London Integrated Care System. So what used to be known as the Strategic Transformation Partnership, I think, STP. Um, and that includes King's Trust in, in Lambeth and Trust in Greenwich and Lewisham as well. The evaluation is still ongoing, um, but we're fairly confident that the, the value of the service will be proven and we'll be able to, uh, um, <clears throat> and, you know, to back up the, the qualitative feedback we get from patients. We'll get some quantitative data to support the case to, to roll it out further. We've received another amount, a small amount of funding. So I guess is that this is the third amount of funding that we've got from another another research grant from a, a pharma company to extend the service to collect different types of PROM, so PROMs for other conditions, so that we can either support more conditions in rheumatology or maybe move it into different services. And that work kicked off, it's actually kicking off at the moment. We started last week. So as promised, I'm just going to share some reflections now. Um, there are many positives to come from this project, but as I, as I said, I'd just like to share some reflections that I've had. Uh, actually, this um, the opportunity to speak about the project again has, has given me the opportunity to, to reflect a bit more. Um, I'm, so I'm gonna try and pull out a few interesting thoughts, which I hope will provoke some questions from people. So on box, one of our core values is, is openness and transparency. And we apply that in our internal communications and also to our projects. So we like to work in the open. We think that working in the open allows us to share knowledge and to build trust with people. Um, <clears throat> and it's a really integral part of this project. We knew that the, the staff at the hospital were slightly wary of improvement programs and a little bit skeptical about our chances of success. They'd also had no experience of user-centered design or agile kind of software product development. So, <clears throat> you know, for them, technology was a real, uh, it wasn't an enabler of change, it was a blocker of change. Technology gets in the way of things they want to do a lot. So we use quite a lot of collaborative tools as we always do. Um, Slack is, a, is, is a, I'm sure people are aware of Slack. Possibly people use Microsoft Teams a lot more than they used to over the last year. Uh, Slack is a bit like that, but better in terms of uh, uh, internal chats and making visibility of conversations and decision making and just uh, exchanging information. Um, we use Trello as a method of visualizing the work that we're doing. 
um, those little, uh, <coughs> we, we break things down into what we call user stories, they're little tokens of work, uh, maybe a feature or something that we're working on. So it's always visible what, what it is we're working on. Um, as a team, we have our daily stand-ups. Uh, so the team uh, congregates for 15 minutes every morning uh, to discuss what they did yesterday, what they plan to work on today, and any, any blockers, any obstacles to progress. This is kind of standard agile, agile practice. Um, and of course, user testing sessions. So regularly testing what either ideas that we had or, um, or thoughts through research and testing prototypes and actually testing the features that we were building. We, we run agile projects in two week sprints, um, which is basically a two week uh, iteration, a two week cycle of work where we plan and deliver for two weeks and then replan and redeliver. Um, <clears throat> so all the constantly user testing what we were building with people uh, at the beginning of each sprint, pr planning and prioritizing what it is we thought was the most important thing to do next. And of course, involving the clinical team and the service managers in the design process. Uh, you know, we know there's a problem we want to solve. How do we go about solving it? As a team, we reflect periodically uh, on, our, on our progress, on our process, um, what's gone well, what's not gone so well to try and improve and continually improve. So continuous improvement is another core unboxed value. And then finally, uh, and probably most importantly, was at the end of every sprint, we do show and tells. So this is where we put together a quick presentation based on the previous two weeks work. We say what it was we planned to do in those two weeks, what we actually did in those two weeks, and what we learned. Uh, and then we would um, suggest what we might work on next for the next sprint and gather feedback from you know, everyone, anyone. We had external interested parties coming along to that. We had. Um, uh, we had uh, key stakeholders. And what we actually did was, um, it was quite difficult to get people to come to us for these meetings. So we actually hijacked what they call their multidisciplinary team meetings, the MDT meetings that the whole rheumatology team would have on a weekly basis. We would take the first 20 minutes, go to them and show progress. It was really useful way for the clinicians to see that the feedback they were giving us was interpreted and was 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 going into the process. So we would go back two weeks later and they'd see the impact of the feedback that, we, that they'd given us and the insights that they'd given us. Obviously, we didn't just do exactly what they'd asked us to do, but it was it was certainly certainly felt like they were being listened to and could influence the process, something they're just not used to with technology at all. Uh, despite our efforts, we got, we got great buy-in, as I say, in the service and, and generally across the directorate of outpatients. But within, within the IT department and the trust as a whole, they, did, they just weren't buying it really. And I think there's a couple of problems, a couple of reasons for that. Um, we were focused on a very particular problem. This was, this was our approach, was to focus in on something quite specific. Uh, and what they were looking for, what the trust is looking for, is scale. So all the time it was like, how can we scale this out across the trust? And we were just saying, we can't, we've got to prove that it works, prove that patients use it, prove that it delivers clinical value. Um, and it's only gonna, we're only gonna prove it in one service. So I think there's a general sense of innovation has to scale quickly. And I understand that there's a, there's a big problem in the NHS around, you know, it's a big organization or lots of big organizations and things need to roll out quickly. But they also had a, a, a solution provider who they were in a kind of partnership with that was doing a similar thing with SMS messaging and, and patient data, gathering patient information, but it was a, it was part of a three year rollout and it wasn't really doing what we wanted to do. So um, I think that hindered things. And I think the biggest thing of all is the, the trust is in the process of procuring a, a new uh, electronic health record. So a new IT system to hold patient data across the trust. And the feeling was that integrating with existing systems was would just be a waste and that the new system would do everything that they everything that we were talking about now i don't believe it will um and plus that is a um that's a five-year absolute minimum five-year project to procure and roll out a new it system and we wanted to move much quicker than that um so in, ultimately the trust didn't didn't buy it they, they didn't they didn't provide any of the funding beyond obviously some people's time um, we had to get the funding from charities. We had to get the funding from, uh, you know, interested companies, often pharmaceutical companies, as I said. So that's the first kind of reflection: how how to get how to get buy-in at a high level. And maybe we'll talk about that a bit at the end. 
Um, <clears throat> Now, the second thing is uh, our user-centered approach is very much about focusing what you're doing on user needs. And we knew that there were apps available for patients to track their, their condition, their, their, the, the, um, some of them specific to rheumatoid arthritis and some very nice mobile phone apps that allow you to lots of visual kind of representation of your condition. Um, but what we, what we don't believe is that people really use them. Uh, and certainly people don't share that information with the hospital. So they may track it themselves, but no one ever comes into the hospital with their, with their app and say, look how I've been doing over the last six months. Um, we knew that PROMs, these PROM forms were completed uh, by patients uh, on paper when they came to the hospital, they were familiar with them, um, but, but they really weren't considered an integral part of patient care by the clinical teams, nor by, nor by the patients. So early testing with patients suggested that they could they could quite easily complete PROMs online. We prototyped a, uh, a mobile screen, a uh, mobile phone app, as you can see there. We went through with patients and they found it quite easy to just go through and answer the questions. And we believed, although you can't really say, you can't really predict what people will do based on what they say they will do, but we believed they would do this regularly if, and this is a big if, they felt that the clinical team were looking at the was looking at the data. So that was a big risk for us. Um, would the clinicians actually use the data? So we actually focused most of our time in terms of user-centered design, you know, um, understanding user needs, uh, designing and, and iterating, getting feedback from users, you know, regularly putting things in front of people and getting their feedback and designing based on their needs. We did that with clinicians rather than patients. Um, and I think that's fine. Uh, <laughs> Patients are users of the system, but actually the tool, the product that we were building, the, 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 the digital tool, the, the main users of that we thought would be clinicians. However, here's the irony, you know, patients absolutely loved the system. Um, they were very enthusiastic and we get nearly 70% completion rate. So for every prom request we send, 70% get, get completed and filled in, which I think is pretty unbelievable, really. But clinicians don't use the system. So <laughs> they we built this chart that I've just shown you earlier on to display the PROM scores, which they don't use. Uh, we built the DAS28 clinical assessment form, which they don't use. Um, we even built quite a sophisticated, I mentioned this blood testing, blood monitoring service, which is just not used. And the reasons for that, the reason that's declared is that the product is not integrated with existing systems. And you'll hear this a lot, and you'll hear this a lot in the public sector. Um, <clears throat> and integration with existing systems is really hard, actually. Uh, it needs a lot of IT resource and it's not really available. So what happens is our system has to be quite secure. Um, patient uh, doctors have to, it's not just a username and password, it's username, password, plus the third, uh, sec a second factor, which is a, a code that they have to then enter as well, and it's time-based code. So it's very secure, and it is a bit of a, a faff for them to, to log into yet another system. They're already logging into quite a few. So that's the kind of point of resistance we get. I think that would be okay if it, if, if it weren't for the fact that we still have a very small number of patients on the system. So I think if you can imagine if a doctor was with a patient and they could guarantee that there would be prom data for that patient, they might log in. But when it's unlikely that that patient is in our system, it doesn't really seem worth them logging in to find out. So that's that's the kind of declared reason of why clinicians don't use it. But I think there's a different reason. This is a, a reflection, a recent reflection. I just don't think they need to, right? It doesn't meet a clinical need. There's lots of potential benefits to the system, but it isn't solving an immediate problem for clinicians. Um, but I think we got away with it. And the reason we got away with it is that we were actually designing not just a product, a digital product, but a service around that product. And as a consequence of creating a service around that product, we, we created our key user who is this uh, coordinator, the system co coordinator that I mentioned before, because it's that coordinator that is actually providing the responsive care that patients value so much. So thanks to the flagging system, they're able to identify patients really easily that might need additional support. Uh, with the SMS communication channel, they can check that they're okay. They can send them, uh, they can send them links to these additional resources I mentioned, and, and, and they can invite them to book a call with a clinician if they need to. So it's this 
coordinator who is now actually managing one coordinator at Guy's and St Thomas's is, is, is coordinating the system across all the hospitals in South London, in that South East London um, uh, partnership that I mentioned before. And, and whilst it's only a small number of patients with a, with a single condition, rheumatoid arthritis, I think that's really encouraging, it's really exciting, that actually with someone, a non-clinical person can provide, really simply provide clinical support um, uh, with the support of clinicians, and it kind of takes a bit of a load off the clinical team, which I think is really great. Um, my final reflection uh, is around this, um, MVP approach. So MVP is a, it stands for minimum viable product. It's a, it's a term that's now widely used, but in my view, rarely understood. It, it comes from a movement known as Lean Startup, which, which lays out a kind of experimental approach to creating new businesses, essentially, uh, aimed at entrepreneurs. And it works on the assumption that most new businesses fail. So 95% of startups fail, something like that. I don't know, that's a, that's a statistic often quoted, but so, on the, on the assumption that your business is likely to fail, you should, you should be very specific on what customer problem it is you're trying to solve. Make sure that that customer feels strongly about that problem and, and wants you to solve it, and that you can identify and test potential solutions very rapidly. Yeah, so it's a kind of experimental uh, thinking about all the assumptions that you have about your idea that need to be true and testing them very rapidly through these experiments. The, the, the mantra being fail fast and learn. So we followed this approach, you know, tested risky assumptions, put a product out there and got live very quickly and had patients using it and we're learning from our patients. But here's where we went wrong. I think this misunderstanding uh, is that M an MVP is not really a thing, it's a process. So it could be, uh, initially it could be a pitch for a, for a product that doesn't even exist or, a, or an ad for a product that doesn't even exist to test the market and, and make sure that people really want the thing that you want to solve the problem you're, you're trying to solve. It might, be, uh, it might be a prototype, a kind of uh, held, to, held together with string and tape, as it were, you know, that you give to people and see them start using it and interacting. And that might be your MVP. Or it could be, as it was in our case, a kind of fully realized product but with limited, limited but critical functionality. Um, but the th the point is, it, it, once it's out into the world, as ours was, ours was within about two sprints of a starting, and then we iterated upon it. But then it needs to be constantly monitored after that, and you need to constantly improve it. So, speaking to the users of the system, capturing data, adding and removing features, until you reach a point where your product is no longer minimally viable but is actually you know, truly viable and sustainable. And, and I'm even gonna say lovable. So some people speak about a minimal lovable product. That's where you need to get to. And what we did is we thought that if we just, sorry everyone, um, we thought that if we just got to our point where our, uh, our MVP was out there, that, that, that everyone would just buy into it and say, oh, that's wonderful. You must keep going and keep throwing money at us which obviously didn't happen. Um, we did get more money, but it was limited and it was spread out over, over, over years actually. That meant that, then that means that our product has remained quite limited to this small group of users. Um, it's in a single service, which is quite limiting. Uh, and it, to be quite honest, it has half finished features. It has, it has test features that we thought we'd just implement and see whether people would use them. And um, it's been very hard for us to maintain the momentum. Uh, to create a kind of, I mean, I do think the product and the service is, is transformative, but it's, 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 quite, it's quite narrow and quite specific. So <clears throat> that's, um, that's about it. That, I, I'm going to just summarize in, in the form of some advice. I don't know if this is really advice or questions, really. Uh, I don't know the answer specifically to this first question. Uh, how to get buy-in at all levels. I think as an organization, we're very good at getting buy-in from service teams, from the people on the ground delivering the service. Uh, we're very good at reconnecting them with their, their customers, as it were. We, we're very good at showing them this design process, this user-centered design research and agile process of building things. But I think you need to find advocates for the process at a high level. You need someone that understands what it is you're trying to do and that there's a, there's a cultural change aspect and that it's okay to start small and grow, uh, grow, grow gradually. 
uh, or start very focused and grow very slow. Advocacy, I think, is really important. The second point is um, design your service alongside your product. So I think people look at the thing we've built and think that's a thing <laughs> and that's the value. That's what should be kind of that's what should be scaled that should be rolled out but actually you know we were designing a product without knowing who our user was because that user didn't exist uh, that user was an internal uh, system administrator really who who didn't exist that post was created as part of the service redesign that went alongside the product and I think that's really important I don't think there is such a thing as a, as a service without digital products these days and I don't think there is such a thing as a product without a service around it so really think about designing the products and the services in, in tandem and finally I think um, I feel like you have to sell the process not the product so <laughs> You know as i say this is not a product that you can take and scale across the whole nhs um it's a process that we've been through that is delivering really encouraging results um but it's the process that made that it's not it's not the end product that's the important thing um although i do believe you know we can enhance it we can scale but you've got to kind of understand the process we've been to and uh, what we've done to kind of make it really useful and valuable um that's it for me uh, I don't know if we have any questions. Um, I'd certainly like to talk about some of it. Ah, I can see some. Okay. Thank you so much for that, Martin. You're welcome. Um, I'm glad you're sharing what you could have done better. I don't think we, we speak about it enough. I think a lot of <laughs> uh, it's not particularly just your project. I just think that everybody in general never really gloss over uh, what they could have improved on. So the question we have here from Jenny, you mentioned that a pharmaceutical company also came on board. How do you manage the balance of their priorities versus the user's needs? So they were really great, actually. It was a, it was a kind of no strings attached fund. It was, a I think they call it research funding, a research grant. So they were interested particularly in the blood monitoring aspects of it, because obviously, um, so the way blood monitoring happens at the moment is that it's quite it's quite random. Uh, the the prescription period for DMARDs or biologics is, which is the the medication for rheumatoid arthritis, it it runs for about three months, I think. And um, if you don't get your blood tests back in time, then patients go without their medication. And as I mentioned before, that's a really bad thing, not just for the short term, but for the long term. Patient, you know, rheumatoid arthritis has been managed quite carefully and aggressively. So they were really interested in how that how we might do something to to help with that. Um, I mean, ironically, that that blood monitoring never actually went live because because integration. We just couldn't get the trust to let us look at the blood test results. Although we'd done that in another service before, um, we did that in a, a sexual health service that we created called SH24. Uh, so we know it's really quite reasonable to pick up blood test results and have a look at them and um, and and flag up things that might be anomalies. Um, but the integration just didn't happen. However, because it was kind of research funding, no spring of tracks, they were really interested in what we were trying to do generally, and it was really loose. They didn't have any, they didn't, they didn't tell us what to do with the money. Um, interestingly, the the reason that this team knew about the, the work we were doing was through the show and tells as well. So at the MDT meetings, the pharma companies sometimes come and buy the team's lunch and they kind of, you know, they attend these meetings and they saw our presentations and they were kind of engaged by the work. Uh, so that open and transparent communication thing really benefited us. Um, and also, I think, a, hard, a lot of hard work from the team, from the clinical director, to Toby, to try and just secure funding. But they didn't, yeah, as I say, they were pretty good about it. It wasn't, it, their needs didn't really conflict with ours at all. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Um, so we have another question from uh, Peter Bryson. Uh, what do you think is the best way to get interest from NHS groups into designing services with the principles in mind, i.e., how do you get them to come looking for you? <laughs> um, we all want to do that. <laughs> yeah, I don't know about the second bit, how we get them to come and look for us, really. But, I, I mean, I'm really, I, I'll be honest, I'm really frustrated. Um, I, we've... <laughs> 
I don't know, to give you an example, we spoke about this uh, a conference called Service Design and Government, and the head of design at um, NHS Digital was, you know, retweeting our talk and saying how wonderful it was to see clinicians involved in digital projects and everything. But I would have thought the role of NHS Digital or, uh, or NHS X, I'm not quite sure what the role of NHS X, X is, um, but I would have thought if they could buy the approach, this kind of keep in encourage innovation, digital innovation within the NHS and engage clinical teams and with the support of specialists like ourselves, I would have thought that would be really attractive to them. But they still seem set on buying products. There's across the public sector, there's this view that you can buy the solution to your problem <laughs> in terms of buying a product. And the result is that, you know, the reason we have all these IT, you know, legacy IT systems that don't really do a good enough job is because people just keep making the same mistakes. They think they can buy a product. So our approach was was very different. It was like, OK, we're going to design the product and the service and then we'll invite suppliers to come and demonstrate to us that their products can support the service we want to deliver. And they just couldn't. <laughs> but that's still that's still the perspective. Um, so I don't know how you get interest from NHS groups. Uh, if, if you meant NHS at a, a high, higher level, um, we, we, we really would like to um, partner with other trusts on it. Though. And as I say, going across the, the integrated care system at South London has got the engagement of other trusts. So hopefully, you know, maybe in 10 years or another, whatever it is, Theo, five or six years, if I'm still talking about this, we'll have got some buy-in from across the NHS into this approach. Okay. Um Thank you for that. Just a personal question, though. What's the difference between digital and X? <laughs> Didn't you? You had a uh, Emma earlier on. I'm sure. Uh, I know. I forgot Emma to ask that. answer that question. I don't really know what the role of NHS X is. To be honest, I think that will play itself out. Uh, I'm not. I'm not an expert in that. I know digital has been a long, around for a long time, and they're managing a lot of technology. They're a technology provider. And I think they they'll slowly start doing some great things. You know, the work of the work that Emma's been doing. Um, there you go. NHS e X equals commissioners. Um, yeah. So we've been doing some work with NHS X around kind of how they evaluate projects, um, which is quite interesting. Um, but yeah, it's from our perspective, we've done work with NHS Digital and NHS X, and it's pretty similar. But uh, I don't know. Okay. So our final question is, uh, do you seek feedback from the trust after your product launch? Have you, um, how have you sought to persuade them to fund future developments? So have we sought, so the product was never really launched, if you know what I mean. We, we're really big believers in avoiding big bang product launches. Uh, we, it, was, it was released within, three four weeks of us starting to build it you know we we onboarded five five users the the moment that we'd uh, created the sms messaging system we onboarded five users and then after the next sprint we onboarded another 10 15 and it, it just grew like that so there's never been a big product launch um we don't <laughs> So Toby, who was working with us on, and I think spoke at this conference two or three years ago with me, actually. Yeah. Um, he, he is now, he was the lead clinician in um, rheumatology, is now the clinical director for the, 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 the director at Specialist Ambulatory Services. And he does a lot of work, but he just, I think he's come to the conclusion, and perhaps it'd be better if he had thought, he's come to the conclusion that the trust will never back this. And actually the only thing to do is to spin it out into some kind of separate, the product at least into a separate maybe I, I talk a lot about community interest companies these kind of um company structures that allow you to invest all profits back into the, the the mission that you're on um perhaps we'll roll the product out into that but as i say i don't really see how that will work because then we just become another product company rather than someone that's actually redesigning services um i can't answer the question what was the question again how how do we how did we try and get buy-in from the, the trust yeah, seek feedback from the trust after the product launch, and how do you sort to persuade them for fund to fund future development? Yeah, I can't tell you. We've we've had so many meetings, um, and an interesting thing that the, the blood monitoring, for example, um, was dependent on integration with the lab systems, and we spent I think about nine months to and froing, having meetings, uh, sending emails, 
and we got to the point where they were like yeah right we'll spend the it was literally two days we'll spend the two days required so that you can integrate with the lab the lab systems and then it just didn't happen other priorities came in there are always other programs of work and other things going on one of the their approach was to this is another thing that i kind of they said okay service design we need to embed service design or design thinking maybe across the organization so we're going to educate everyone in design thinking um and I just don't think that's the right approach. I think you need to be running these projects right through end to end to from nothing to a, a live service. And then you learn about the processes. So, um, yeah, I, I, I honestly, we, we had many meetings. In fact, um, uh, um, uh, just as, as the first lockdown happened, a new, um, I think, technology director came into the trust and said, yes, we're going to go ahead. We're going to get this thing integrated with the system so it can be fully used. And then lockdown happened and that stopped. So it was quite frustrating. <laughs> I mean, there is interest and there is, there's just not commitment. Do, do, you, know, do you know what I mean? They're, they're looking to see if it will succeed. Yeah. Um, and actually the clinical, uh, the, the CCG has been m more interested actually than the trust itself. I don't know who's who's going to end up with i think trust jumps just don't see it as their responsibility to drive this kind of product innovation and service innovation but i don't know whose it is okay so so thank you for that martin i, I actually just want to i don't even know if this is a question or a statement i know you mentioned earlier on that you know the clinicians weren't really using the product um yeah. and clinicians are inevitably the users as well and, uh, yeah what do you put that down to really i know you covered it in a bit but is it yeah. down to the fact that they have just just inundated with work and and systems that they have to follow and processes yeah yeah they just don't want an, another system another disjointed system i mean we knew this it's mvp we knew it would be when you're creating an mvp you can't spend months and months doing integrations and you can't have you know you, know, you can't really build spend all your time building fantastic admin features so there's always rough edges and there's always a little bit of hardship sometimes it does mean more work uh in the mvp um but yeah i think they just so we've just done another piece of work around proms about patient uh, a survey across the trust to understand how people are using proms across the trust and what systems they are using and what they find good about them and what they don't find 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 good about them and the overwhelming response about whether this would be successful or not was whether it would integrate with existing systems it was just the it was the key concern and you know toby and i were discussing it is it actually a concern or is there something else do they really just not see the value in it there's so much potential for proms from like literally influencing the care affecting the pathway that each individual patient is on based on proms to um population statistics um you know looking at population health if you look at the data aggregate data yeah and and also um even kind of service performance uh you know uh, it is it, there's really loads of potential um but yeah it's just that integration thing and, and, and i know nhs digital and nhs x to a certain extent and doing a lot to talk about data standards and interoperability and all that kind of stuff but it's just going to take years and years and years to fix that problem. <laughs> years and years and years. So it, it, it is a genuine concern, but yeah. it's difficult because doctors and clinicians are so busy focused on the day to day. They're firefighting, essentially. There are things in front of them that need to fix. They're looking at the here and now, and it's very difficult for them to kind of, you know, ignore that to think about the future. Yeah. We, we had some, you know, I, I do think we really got buy-in from the clinicians in, in, in the service. There was a, one of the things we were asked to do with the, the initial funding was to replace an, an old data, uh, database for rheumatoid arthritis that was created by one of the clinicians. It was award-winning like 10, 15 years ago. And they were convinced that we should be replacing all the features of that system into a new system. But actually they came, they came around to our way of thinking and said, no, this is actually much more interesting, this remote monitoring, and you should spend the resources, the time and the money on that. So um, yeah, legacy IT, who's, who's gonna fix that problem? Yeah, <laughs> that's so true. Okay, Martin, thank you so much for that, man. It's always great speaking to you. And yeah, seeing you too. Thanks, thanks yeah. for the invitation. Thanks, Martin, I'll speak to you soon, dude. Thank you. Thank you.